It is my great pleasure to introduce today Joyce Nyairo as um, our third keynote address um, in the framework of this conference. And um, perhaps you've listened already to the two other keynote addresses, um, and you will also listen to the last tomorrow. Um, and you've heard the day before yesterday that introductions to keynote addresses are usually an exaggeration. Um, and that's right, but this one will not be an exaggeration because uh, the introduction will not look like the ones uh, that you've, you've heard, heard yesterday, yesterday and the day before yesterday. yesday. It, it does, does not mean that Joyce doesn't have the academic credits uh, that the others have. She is um, an eminent scholar in her field, and that is a field that is um, a little bit um, interdisciplinary, especially behind the frontiers of what we usually do. And I'll try to explain why that is so. Um, Perhaps I should also mention that uh, she also has uh, the credits of the BA and MA from the University of Nairobi and a PhD from WITS in South Africa. Um, but what she does in a different way than we usually do it, and I include myself, is that um, she doesn't simply draw on theories and try to apply them to some place in Africa or to some social practice or to some urban practice to frame it a little narrower. So she is not really interested in theory for theory's sake. It is more about um, bridging the often enormous gap between theory and practice. And uh, this is um, what goes back or speaks to the point that you've heard in the introductory talk um, yesterday, uh, speaking in different tongues. And not only in tongues, practice also means very often bodily practice. Um, urban space is, um, as Joyce is um, demonstrating herself, very often a product of creative, of popular imagination. Um, but imagination is not simply a sort of assemblage of objects. It is something different. It is a practice. Imagining should be the right word for it. Something that people do and something that people do day in and day out. They need to do it because without such imagining they would be unable to make sense of their cities and even they would be unable to make the cities as cities, as urban social spaces. And that means that the most ephemeral elements of urban social practice are what Joyce is interested in. Um, it can be just a word or two that is borrowed from a song. It can be a small movement that uh, also refers to a particular dance. It can be a word in the local sheng, in a slang that only uh, the youth speaks. And in order to do so, in order to understand how that feeds into the imagining of urban social spaces in Africa, you cannot work from a desktop, but you also cannot work through interviews. Interviews are reducing the enormous complexity of urban social life to a few words, if I may summarize this thus. But what really is important and what is much more important than interviews and the words that you provoke when you talk to somebody is to participate in that urban social practice. And that is something that um, is much more rarely done than we believe it is. As social anthropologists, we sometimes believe that we participate in everything that goes on in a city, but that's not really true. It is not true. Um, sometimes because of our age, in my case, for instance, I'm too old for that. Um, but it's also sometimes uh, not possible because we lack the skills and competences to do so. I'm a very bad dancer, for instance, and therefore cannot <laughs> participate in some of the most important social practices that are linked also to popular music and to popular dancing in Africa. And I dare to say so that uh, Joyce has managed to bridge that gap. And that makes her work so innovative and also so important for us who are unable to do what, what she is able to do and what we should be able to do. Um, so how with these 
tiny ephemeral movements, sometimes in a moment when you just face somebody, when you just encounter somebody, within seconds, you become aware of what urban politics really are, how people articulate their opinions about their cities, whether they have a right to their city, whether they have a right to political decision making or not. And a second point here that is also very important, at least from my point of view, is um, that she has always gone beyond the grand dichotomies of, for instance, domination and resistance. These grand dichotomies do exist to some extent, but they also capture only a very little, a small part of what urban life really is. So, um, where the importance of Joyce Nyhoff's work is, is that she thinks beyond these grand dichotomies and is not simply deconstructing them, as so many of us try to do when we think about these dichotomies. So, for instance, she is not concerned whether um, people who borrow, in inverted commas, from American hip-hop actually pollute African culture or not. That is the wrong question for her, the wrong question that doesn't deserve an answer. It is much more how the practice itself generates a sort of um, shared and sometimes even joint intentionality towards the object that the city is in the minds of many. So that is the innovative side of Joyce, but there is also another side, and that is something that I need to mention here too, that is the rigor of her thinking about um, scholarly work. Um, many of you have research projects uh, that um, address questions of popular culture, urban culture in different parts of Africa, and so had we. And, um, Joyce was uh, invited by the Volkswagen T Foundation to comment on her work, and that was really, and that was in northern Nigeria, not really the place where um, Joyce belongs to. <laughs> um, that was in northern Nigeria when um, she had given us uh, the most valuable advice how to continue with our work. That book is out, um, and Joyce also has published a lot of books about the same subject, about um, urban popular culture, in particular music and lyrics that people have engaged in. And what urban Africa and urban Africans um, do, how they create urban spaces, that is also the subject of her talk today. And I'm very pleased, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you all for being here this morning. And thank you very, very much to the three men, Alicia Makamo, Till Foster, and Viet Alt, who reached out with the invitation, and then employed words of serious flattery to convince me that I should come and do this. They said very nice things about my voice. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, um, it was an interesting exchange of, of emails, and I'm really grateful that you did ask me to do this. Um, and it is truly humbling for me, because when I looked at the theme of this conference, the memories that filled my head and my heart as well were those from 12 years ago, that first ICAS meeting in London, where I was asked to give a keynote address that was the Mary Kingsley Zochonis lecture, and I titled my talk that day, Modify Joakali as a Metaphor for Africa's Urban Ethnicities and Cultures. Now, to speak of Africa and Africans in that all-encompassing way always borders on dangerous talk. So what I'm going to do, just like I did back in London in 2005, what I'm going to do is to focus on Kenya and zero in on the social cultural practices of a very specific demographic. Because even though I have spent many years studying popular culture as a lens into urban identities, in 2015, um, when I wrote the book Kenya at 50, 
trends, identities, and the politics of belonging, I began to worry that my understanding of Kenyan urban identities as fluid, reworkable consciousness that can and does manipulate and veer away from the confines of traditional ethnic identity was not in touch with experiences across all the economic classes that exist in a city. That maybe I was listening too much to the loudest in our midst. And that in fact, my focus on the capital city Nairobi might have missed out on some critical sociocultural differences that are to be found in smaller towns and in the margins of such towns. What does the sociocultural underbelly of towns look like? Is it always true that a growing income fuels and determines one's ability to disconnect from village moors and ties? Can we measure this disconnection by mapping new bonds, by interrogating stated boundaries, analyzing emerging rituals of belonging? That's what that slide is about. Now, to answer all these questions, I focused my study on the sociocultural practices that shape and are shaped by street-connected children and youth in Eldoret, which is the headquarters of Wasingishu County. I'll just give you an idea of where that is over there. According to the 2009 Kenya Population Housing Census, Eldoret has a population of 289,389 people, and it is the fifth largest town in Kenya. But if you live in Eldoret, you will admit that it feels like a lot more people than that, primarily because it has so many institutions of higher learning and a lot of students come into the town for three, four, six months at a time. It is also the headquarters of an agricultural county. And so the practice of farmers coming from the outside, from the rural areas into town on Fridays and Saturdays to do their banking, to purchase fertilizer and so on, just makes the town always feel like a little more than 289,000 people. But it is the fifth largest town in Kenya. And street persons stand at 0.6% of this population. I think what we also want to do is pay attention to UNICEF's definition of street persons. There are, as the slide explains, there are those children who live on the street. So they spend a portion of their time there working to provide uh, for their families, but they often go home at night. They have another place with members of family, uh, grandmothers, whatever, where they spend the night. They are children of the street who work and sleep on the streets um, because they don't have any contact with family members. They may be orphaned or they may have run away. We'll get to talk about that a little. And then they are what I call, uh, what UNICEF defines as children from the street um, who live with their families, with a parent, with a sibling, actually on the street. So they're not disconnected from family in the way that children of the street are. Um, so we'll pay attention because categories are applicable to the work that I've been doing. Now, every so often, news filters in through local and international news media that police have killed street children in Eldoret. Our collective outrage over these systematic violations of human rights are hardly ever assuaged by claims that this homeless children have made the streets of Eldoret unsafe. I want to engage with this matter of homelessness, not as an economic or as a law and order issue primarily, but as a social cultural phenomenon. And my core texts are recent health and well-being studies of Eldoret street connected children and youth. And what I'll do is to use uh, those texts, the health and well-being studies, along with media reports, and along with my own participant observer methods, um, Till has said a lot about how well I dance. Um, so I'll mix all those methods to piece together a narrative of street life in Eldoret. What are its mores, what are its rituals? Now the health and well-being studies of street-connected children and youth, they do not do enough to draw the links between the ethos of street life and the physical environment in which street-connected children and youth live. And that is understandable. What those studies do is to recognize the psychosocial bonds that exist on the street, and they highlight the health risks that are created by initiation rituals into street life. But as some of the researchers themselves quote, 
Further studies are needed to better understand these rituals. And so that's what I'll be trying uh, to do today. I treat culture, a piece uh, Pierre Bourdieu, as a fluid system where shared meanings and understandings are created, recreated, and maintained through physical performance. The emergent rites of passage in the street community demonstrate how an identity and a community are built and reinforced against cycles of rejection and running battles for recognition and acceptance. One of my fundamental assumptions, which is inspired by the work of Michel Foucault and Edward Said, is that places get woven into a person's sense of self. Questions about how people experience a place, the affective and experiential dimensions of everyday urban life will feature in my discussion of the codes and values that homeless children in Eldoret have developed. I have there a glossary of terms that I'll, I'll keep you. You can just take a look at it. Um, and so, like I said, I, I want to really study the everyday experiences of these street communities and, and to think about the codes and the values that they have developed. For instance, how do young and supervised children respond to a town that is full of sakatis, as you can see there, that's a narrow back alley. How do young and supervised children respond to a town that is full of congested sakatis, streetwares, unruly border borders, noisy, untamable matatus, and other informal, unzoned spatial layouts? These are some of the things that I hope to draw some conclusions about. Now, the demographic that I'm talking about, the street-connected children and youth, um, very often invite profiles of want, as you can see from those uh, reports, profiles of social decay, of decadence, of disease, and corruption. Indeed, whenever the subject of glue-sniffing street children is raised, policymakers speak in tones of moral outrage that overlook a positively transformative agency. Instead, repeatedly invoke otherness by castigating what they only see as deviance as a nuisance affront to public good. Depictions of the absence of human rights in street life and profiles of its threat to the institution of family are valid concerns and valid academic approaches to understanding this phenomenon of street-connected children and youth. However, is it possible for us to read this demographic through additional lenses that emphasize their socioeconomy, their deliberately constituted practices of belonging, their ways of constructing community driven by agency, devoid of self-pity, and rooted in a fundamental belief in the possibility of creating an alternative community that in some way echoes and in some way resists and differs from the prescriptions of contemporary society. Can we look at them a little differently than just saying that they are a problem? Can we identify the things that mediate their existence, the things that make street-connected life an evolving culture that we must seek to understand. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is finding a home. How does a street become a home? Street-connected children and youth experience recurring moments of rejection and expulsion, as I started by saying. They are newcomers in a space that is dominated by many who would like to claim earlier arrival and call themselves indigenous. And you know the work that Peter Gesher has done um, in the perils of belonging. That informs a lot of my thinking about who belongs, who doesn't, and how are those claims articulated. On October 15, 2011, the Star newspaper in Nairobi reported that 250 urchins were rounded up by Wasingishu County government officers on October 11th and deported to their counties of origin. The street families, who included mothers suckling their kids, were then dumped at Kochoria Trading Center in Amagoro, Teso North Sub-County. The report went on to explain that the government sent the children to the counties they identified as their homes. However, the street children have since returned to Eldred Town. Most of them said they have lived in Eldred Town all their lives and they know no other home. That was a newspaper report. Now, Within that report, the Wasingishu deputy governor, Daniel Chemno, told the press that he understands that the constitution gives everyone a right to live where they choose, but he was adamant that all that the county government had done was to connect Eldred Street children to their parents. Now, the county where they were sent, Busia County, 
when the governor, Sos Peter Ojamong, was interviewed, he was very irked by this turn of events and regretted the dumping of people in a county where they don't have homes. Whatever side of the rage they were on, the thing about these two county officials is you can see that they are distinguished by their singular belief in an ethno-linguistic identity and a rural grassroots as the only valid definitions of home, the only definitions of a Kenyan identity. Presumably then, the boundaries of each county are defined by ethnic parameters and street-connected children and youth must be located within ethnic boundaries that are defined for them. Going by the newspaper report, however, the children in question had a totally different notion of their home and their identities. So I think we need to interrogate this word home, what it means to different generations and different demographics in Kenya, and how, in the minds of some, the urban street can constitute a home. And you can see the tensions I'm talking about there between an ethno-linguistic identity by somebody else and the whole process of self-identifying. When you listen to the voices of the street-connected children and youth, they don't define themselves, they don't identify themselves, they don't think of home in the way that county government officials um, do. And so there's that tension in definitions of identity that plays up again and again whenever you're talking about urban existence. Now, David Ayuku, who is one of the pioneers in the study of the psychosocial behavior of street-connected children and youth, demonstrates that street children, I quote, of different ethnic backgrounds socialize together and do not show the same degree of ethnic exclusiveness and animosity that is found among adults in many segments of Kenyan society. When joking and fighting, there were no expressions of ethnic animosity that would be common with adults in similar situations. The street-connected children and youth networks are characterized uh, by many of uh, the people who undertake these health um, and well-being studies as pseudo-families because they have clearly developed structures of affiliation and exchange that give members guarantees of support and care. Now, one of those researchers, um, Rebecca Sober, works in a group, and her statement, uh, or the statement of their report, was that male street youth by no means have an easy lifestyle, experiencing significantly increased interaction with legal authorities and the detention system. However, the responses of the boys in our study support the ideas set forth by previous research, portraying groups of boys who, in the face of hardship, are able to develop diverse strategies of earning money and to form strong support networks of friends. Now clearly then, we can see, the streets are used to replace a home life and they are also sources of income. Full-time street youth maintain a large group of friends which provide functions expected from a family. One newspaper report observes that despite constant harassment by municipal council Ascaris, um, guards, you know, police, William and his friends are optimistic enterprising and have a strong sense of fraternity. They work together as a barefoot informal recycling unit. You know, they pick garbage and they take it for recycling and they are paid for that work. Now indeed, as the work of Judy Washira and other health researchers has underlined, the fact that these children remain on the streets with hostile conditions signifies their sense of belonging, value, and solidarity that they place in their structures. The reasons why these children escaped the streets in the first place are many. Uh, they include poverty, alcoholism, violent abuse at home. Recent studies have refuted what was once a dominant assumption that many of these children um, escaped because of ethnic violence related uh, invariably to elections, because of delinquency, and because of boredom. There are studies that argue that is not the point. But I think I want to make the point here that we shouldn't underestimate the effects of election-related ethnic violence on families, because in many instances, it is the dispossession that accompanies that violence that creates new levels of poverty. And of course, when parents are unable to provide for their children, families disintegrate very quickly, new lines of authority emerge as younger providers distinguish themselves. And I think we might also want to understand delinquency and boredom a little differently, a little more broadly than Sober et al. do, because I think that some of these street-connected children and youth, from my conversations with them, 
are victims of an education system that has not always factored in different learning needs or abilities, such as dyslexia. So a child who is dyslexic, for example, is very quickly labeled a problem child in school and at home. And as things become more and more difficult, that child uh, is really facing rejection on both fronts and will very soon run away from both school and home because they are unbearable. So I think delinquency has you know, many roots and it should not be dismissed as a factor for why children end up on the street. Now, in probing their sense of belonging, the first thing we should note about street-connected children and youth is that they have coined their own name for their identity. They think of themselves as a group, and they refer to them when you have conversations with them. Um, you know, sometimes we've had meetings to talk about their needs and so on, and speaker after speaker will always use the phrase, jamii ya mashefa, sisi kama jamii ya mashefa. Yeah? If we go back uh, to the glossary, uh, sorry, there it was. Yeah? Mshefa is a single term. Jamia Mashefa is the family of children. They refer to themselves repeatedly in that way. Now, compared to the term Chokora, which is the mainstream term that uh, has been used for street children right from the 60s, probably even the right from the 60s, I think, the term Chokora, which denotes a dirty scavenger. Mshefa has very different connotations. It's really a term of agency. It carries the positive connotations of one who is self-sustaining. Now, this matter of self-identification is obviously central to the idea of accepting the street as home because it refutes mainstream identity markers which are centered on ethno-linguistic identities in which a big deal is made out of somebody's surname, including a commonplace assumption that one necessarily speaks the language that is denoted by their surname. If you know Kenyans very well, you will look at somebody's surname and draw a conclusion about where they come from. You may not always be correct. Now, the interesting thing for me in, in uh, engagements with these children and, and youth is that they have a very heightened sense of the politics of tribe in Kenya. When you get into a conversation with many of them, they will either, if you ask, you know, what's your name, they'll adopt a generic shame name like Kevo, which is a derivative of Kevin. Now, that doesn't tell you anything much about them. They're speaking in Sheng. You can't quite place their accent because they learned how to talk on the street. It's just pure Sheng. But the other thing they do with you know, such amazing fluidity is if they hear as if you sound, you have an accent that suggests you're from a certain part of the country, they adopt that name. So if you speak with a Kamba accent and you ask the boy, uh, what's your name? He'll say, Mutisu. Because he knows that that will create an affinity. Mutisu is a Kamba name. That will create an affinity between you and him. So they're very, very, um, I, I find it interesting that they have a very heightened sense of the politics of tribe and the way it works in, in, in Kenya. Now, Sheng is, of course, the language. Sheng uh, defined as a demotic street language which borrows from Swahili, English, and several ethnic languages. That is the chosen language of Jamii Yamashefa. Now, the second thing we should note, apart from the fact that they profess their own name, their own identity, is that they have demarcated their own boundaries within the town. They have clearly defined spaces, which they refer to as barracks or bases. And these bases have designated names, some of which have been coined by the residents of the street themselves. Some might be named after a particular street or a particular area, but very often they have picked out the names themselves. And those are the barracks, roughly, um, it's not accurate geographically because Jumahaji should have come before California, but there it is. Um, so California, Jumahaji, Assis, Barakea, Steve O. Steve is somebody's name, must have been the big gang leader. Uh, Mangula, Juakali, Isli, and West. In Kenya, we say Isili. Now, these barracks are filled with social meanings for street-connected children and youth. They are the places where they earn their keep, the places where many of them find rest at night, and try to create moments of security away from the hostilities of the open street where they are harassed by angry urban residents. The base is their private space. In carrying out their hustle or income earning activities, base members must respect the physical boundaries of another base. Transgressions are actually punished very severely. As with any social group, leadership positions exist. Sometimes you will emerge as a leader because you fought everybody else and you're the strongest. Other times they will actually have elections. They line up and say, you know, this one and this one and this one, let's decide between you, and they will have elections and decide who their leader is. And there are roles um, 
for that leader that, that I will discuss as we go along. The point is, a base leader has full command of his group, whether you want to call that group gang or something to the, the word gang later on. But, but the point is that the leader disciplines errant members, protects the younger ones, and initiates new arrivals. Now, now let's talk about that initiation. How do you become a member of a street community? It's not wine. Um, in, in a study published in 2015, Judy Washira et al. document the initiation rights that boys and girls are respectively taken through before they can become members of a base. And I'll just show them to you there. The first thing is interrogation. Whether you're a boy or a girl, you come into the street, the base leader will call you and interrogate you, why are you here? And if your reason doesn't sound very good, they will whip you enough to chase you to go back if your re the reason sounds immediately very credible, you're an orphan, you've lost your relatives, you don't know where they are, you are displaced during ethnic clashes, they will allow you to remain. But it's not that simple. Uh, they are dues to be paid, mostly physical. You will be wrapped up as a boy. Um, you'll have to endure a lot of uh, taunting and so on. Some kids will go back at that point. They will decide, this is too much, I can't take the physical abuse, and run away. Then there are financial dues. There's a tax system, like in any community. That tax is decided by the leader. It could be 20 shillings every day for five days, or if you're a bigger boy, it could be 50 shillings uh, for two weeks. Whatever that rate is decided, you have to pay a tax before you get full admission rights. Um, and then what happens is, if you've passed all of those tests, then you will be ceremonially accepted. Um, and I'll, I'll just come back to talk about that after we look at what the girls go through. I should have said that with the boys, some of the younger boys will actually be sodomized as part of the physical abuse. Now, after they have passed the initial interrogation, girls who have freshly arrived on the street might be roughed up by other girls and asked for money. Invariably, the male um, street-connected children and youth will seduce a new girl and ask her to choose a husband. The older girls will advise new ones to select a husband very quickly because it is the best way to avoid gang rape which is known on the street as kupiga kombi, combination. While sodomy is punished severely by base leaders, the rape of women is not, not unless the man who rapes the girl is not a mshefa, a member of the shefa community. In such instances, mshefa will hunt down the offender and beat him thoroughly. For example, if it's a watchman in town, they will waylay him at some point, beat him thoroughly, and accuse him of, in their lingo, spoiling their vegetables. As Washira et al. argue, the idiom, boga ya jeshi, vegetables for the army um, or for the soldiers, which is used to refer to street girls, denotes that girls are sexual objects that are available to any street boy. New street girls are therefore in high demand because they are viewed as fresh vegetables for the street soldiers. Sometimes the older girls will act as pimps, receiving money from the boys for the service of taking them to a new girl. The older girls rarely ever try to protect new arrivals from rape. They argue that arrivals should go through the same brutal experiences that they themselves experience since this will harden them. Stealing money and valuables from arrivals is common, boys or girls. The older street-connected children and youth will do it to assert their dominance. Now, ultimately, the initiate, boy or girl, is smeared in black suit that is taken from burnt tires. This is an identity marker that presumably gives the initiate the appearance of a battle-hardened, resilient, and rough-living hustler or mshefa. Physical appearances are critical to the professed identity of mshefa. In my discussions with the boys, they tell stories of street-smart girls who will deliberately smear themselves with dirt in order to shield themselves from unwanted overtures. So they'll wear their dirtiest clothes, they'll pick filth, and you really look like people you don't want to go near. And the girls do that deliberately because they don't want the attentions of men on the street. Men on the street are easily put off by that unkempt, scruffy appearance. When it suits them, especially towards evening, these same girls will clean up, dress smart, and hang around specific corners, uh, specific street corners where they solicit men for transactional sex. Dirt is consciously employed as a shield. In yet another study, uh, Washira et al. demonstrate that girls use pregnancy in the same way. 
a girl will get pregnant because it shields her from verbal harassment by fellow Mashefa who, you know, refer to the girls as, by way of abuse, they will call a girl barren. Or a girl will have a husband who is very anxious um, to have children because that gives him status in the community. Fatherhood is a big status, and so they put pressure on the girls to get pregnant. So as Washira et al. argue, for street-connected girls, pregnancy becomes a street coping mechanism, a way to belong. I was fascinated by the way clothes reveal as much as they conceal. Girls will reportedly wear three pairs of leggings to deter rapists. Boys will wear huge jackets to tuck away their bottles of glue in that lightning moment when they need to appear harmless to an adult who can be tapped for a few shillings. In yet another instance, that large overcoat that the boy wears is actually a mobile safe. He puts all his worldly belongings in there because back at the base, you can't guarantee security away from the municipal Ascaris. You don't know when the next raid will be. And these kids do have money. Uh, we've talked about the work they do recycling uh, garbage, plastics and metal and so on. Um, they're involved in a lot of gambling games on the street, the kind of games we used to call patapotea. So they do have some money. Um, somebody might have a radio, somebody might have a cell phone, and in there, in that huge, large overcoat, they tuck in everything that they own. The large overcoat can give a skinny lad a stature that he does not really have, and that enables him to intimidate a younger um, child or, or youth or a nervous woman uh, at dusk. In every instance, street-connected children and youth are consciously staging what I call sartorial performances for their immediate and direct benefit. They use clothes to create visibility when they need it and to create inv invisibility when they need that, when it is beneficial to them. They perform with the kind of creativity and ingenuity that Till Foster describes as emancipation from social constraints. Now, by the same token, Street-connected children and youth show a lot of agency in the way they loop in and out of mainstream social cultural practices like marriage. There are marriages on the street. There are no formal ceremonies, exchange of vows, whether civil or religious, but once a couple decide they are an item, the young man will go and look for a house uh, somewhere where he can pay a minimal rent. Uh, what I found fascinating is that um, while the men say that they leave their women their wives at home, and they come to work on the street during the day and go back home at night. Well, the girls told me they are very free to go about their affairs during the day, including to have extramarital relationships, to earn their own money, and then go back home at night before the men arrive. Let's not spend too much time on that thought. Um, now, even, <laughs> I mean, the point is this, that um, I, I found it interesting the role that marriage plays in their midst, but in the same way that children are revered, in mainstream culture, Mashefa take pride in being parents, and they strongly believe that their children will have a better life than theirs. And it's interesting to see how they negotiate that space. They will put their children in a school in a rescue center, or even take the child to a children's home and ask whether they can visit that child occasionally. In other words, they are as aspirational as Kenyans in the mainstream who toil daily to put their children through private school where their chances of success are deemed to be much higher than they would be in a public school. Now beyond the differences in their part-time and full-time occupation on the street, are street-connected children and youth homogeneous? Their rights of admission seem to suggest so. You know, you move from one barrack to the other and they have the same rights of admission. But conversations with them reveal deep suspicions in the way street-connected children of one base will talk about the ones of another. What's interesting for me is that the suspicions parallel age-old Kenyan tensions between rural and urban populations. Mashefa Watown, as they are called, the ones who live in the CBD like California, are deemed to be more cunning, dishonest, sexually permissive, and rough. Those from farther away from the town center in places like Langas or West are said to be uh, naive. But Mashefa or California, who live right in the center of town, just below Kenyatta Street, see themselves as more moral than those in West and Isli, whom they accuse of sodomy and to whom they ascribe the label mamende, um, which in Swahili is simply cockroaches, but it, it, in, in, in street lingo it means homosexuals. It's interesting to see when you talk to them how angry they are about homosexuality and how they draw some of those ideas from mainstream society. And I argue that misogyny and gendered attitudes to sex mirror the, those in mainstream Kenyan society to the extent that women are seen as the carriers of sexual diseases and are frequently 
physically punished and socially stigmatized for their perceived spread of sexually transmitted infections and for procuring abortions. It's worth noting that street-connected children and youth have attitudes to condoms um, that echo those of popular urban idioms in the 1990s. Um, so for example, they will say, you can't eat a sweet while it is still wrapped. Um, that kind of attitude to the use of condoms is very similar to the kind of conversations that used to go on in the 90s when there was the attempt to popularize condom use as a contingent against um, HIV, the spread of HIV AIDS. Now the misconceptions about diseases and contraceptives are too many for me to go into here, but clearly they reflect the low levels of literacy, the low uptake of opportunities for awareness programs, and the dominance of urban legends in this community which draws its beliefs and its knowledge base from shared oral narratives and the popular songs that boom from loudspeakers on shop verandas. Now I want to talk about criminality because that label has been thrown on street connected communities all the time by county government officials. They are accused of making the town unsafe. And I want to talk about criminality against what I call the death of public good. The violent expulsion of street families in Eldred by county officials is often accompanied by statements about the need to make the town safe again. When was it ever? Um, in the Star newspaper report of October 21st, 2015, the Deputy Governor Chemno justified the expulsion of these children, stating that, and I quote, the street families have been linked to several killings in the town. Muggings, robbery, pickpocketing, and vandalism of vehicle tires, side mirrors, among many other criminal activities. Many people have been complaining about them, and we want to make this town secure. The same people who are pressurizing us to ensure that the town security is beefed up are rushing to criticize us for taking the street children to their homes. Last year, October 10, 2016, the Guardian newspaper reported that on May 21st, Municipal Council Ascaris and Administration Police gathered at the California barracks in town for what was described as a carefully planned operation, systematic, meticulous. Many of the children jumped into Sosiani River to escape the brutal assault from cudgels, tear gas, and rifles. Most of them didn't know how to swim, so they drowned. Six children died that day, and over the next two days, the corpses of five more children would wash up downstream. The only response from the county administration was that police actions against street community was a measured response to counter petty crime blamed by some in the city on street children. Coming after the February 2015 attack, when 30 children were bitten by police dogs, human rights activists argued that Wasingishu County had embarked on a policy of trying to rid Eldoret of its street children by killing them or killing enough of them to force the others to flee. Peter Chomba, who is a member of the Wasingishu County Assembly, linked the killings to electoral politics. In that same Guardian newspaper, he said, what is happening is an attempt to claim this place for one community. Chomba's statement dramatizes the scars that run through Eldoret's popular memory, along with the October 2015 dumping of street-connected children and youth in Busia County, the killing of street-connected children uh, last year was conflated with the 1992 and 1997 land clashes, as well as the 2007-2008 post-election violence. The critical questions that lie at the heart of Chomba's alarm are these. What are the rights of newcomers? What confers upon them a sense of belonging? One is legal. Sorry. Um, I missed that slide. I'm not sure where it is. Yeah, that's what we're looking at. Um, what are the rights of newcomers? What confers upon them a sense of belonging? One is legal, the other is cultural, and sometimes it is political. On the legal front, Eldred Street connected children and youth over the age of 18 years are invariably unable to obtain identity cards. Their applications are bogged down by their inability to provide records of their birth, because to get a national identity card, you need a birth certificate. You need your father's identity card. You don't know who your father is. You don't know how old you are. You may be 18 or you may be 25. You don't know. Um, so what do you present? And in as much as there are programs that try to help these children to gather these documents, you can imagine, for example, for you to ascertain your age uh, from a hospital, you need to pay 300 shillings. Now, if you're a child on the street, what are your priorities? What is this 300 shillings, um, which is about $3, 3 US dollars, what is it best used for? 
Yeah? Um, so there are a lot of difficulties for these street-connected children and youth in getting registration documents. What happens is that even though they, these children, as I've tried to demonstrate, even though they have devised all manner of cultural bonds that have found their belonging on the streets of Eldoret, when the local authorities attack and evict them on the pretext of weeding out criminals, their applications for identity documents are frustrated even further because chiefs will refuse to certify them. Because once you gather all those documents that you need, including your parent ID, you need to go to a chief to certify, yes, this person lives in this area. And what happens is when the politics of Eldoret becomes so hot, even when NGOs and other organizations have tried to get documents for these kids, the chiefs panic and they don't want to go ahead with this process of legitimizing um, the existence, the belonging of the street communities. So they don't sign the documents. Now, I argue that, you know, in political terms, Eldred Street connected children and youth are subject to the perils of belonging that have their root in Kenya's colonial history. It is a history of displacement, a history of divide and rule, of discriminatory laws, and of engineered claims of autochny, all of which come back to haunt the county in what I call ritual cycles of brutal forced eviction that are aimed at the weakest. The failure to address the deep structural roots of children living on and off the street is made worse by these knee-jerk resorts to physical removal. Additionally, these removals um, have the potential, actually, to escalate into unquenchable political fires. I find an abiding irony in the Wasangishu government's, um, county government's own rights of violence. You know, we've talked about how street-connected children and youth initiate each other through violent means. Isn't it true that the county government also uses a process of rights of violence um, to test one's be uh, belonging? Equally disturbing for me is the failure to see that the subjectivities of street-connected children and youth, including their brutal rights of initiation, are directly shaped by the spatial dynamics of the town. The town was built soon after Boer farmers moved to the area in 1910. They demarcated part of 64 Farm as their post office, and the place was named Eldoret in 1912. And like all Kenyan towns built in the colonial era, it followed a strict urban plan designating commercial areas separately from residential areas. Now in turn, residential areas followed a strict racial code. So the whites lived on Eastern Avenue and in Elgon View, the Indians lived in West Indies, and the Africans lived in Eldoret West, um, which is very often called Kihuga Square. Now everywhere, including in Eldoret, where racial, you have racially segregated towns, they generated their own social psychosis. I argue that by the same token, the shift of all these towns from planned environs into informal arrangements that are marked by illegal densification of old spaces, the emergence of stalls and makeshift dwellings in the CBD and on the outskirts of the town has generated its own kind of psychosis. Now you can call them urban uncertainties, but a town in which matatus designate their own speed, their own route and schedule, where colleges spring up above bars and banks are sandwiched between hostels, is a town where the senses are open to a fair amount of variety, shall we call it, or uncertainty. Uh, and I think that the body undergoes, you know, a certain, you know, as, mind, as much as the mind is trying to deal with all this variety, at the same time, um, the body also goes through you know, several physical challenges as you're trying to jump over an open uh, trench and to skirt through a poorly lit uh, sakati or alley, you're dodging past overflowing rubbish heaps and sewers. If I was to be brutal, I would argue that the rot in the towns has become the rot in families and vice versa. The one reinforces the other on a daily basis. The loud transgressions of border borders echo the disjuncture of dirt-smeared street-connected children and youth. It is an atmosphere of ingenuity that defies old order, one that cannot be put right by victimizing the weakest as if they alone are solely responsible for the vibrant and predictable spatial layout that was once an antiseptic town. Now, I think that, um, you know, that was a point I was asking about the rights of newcomers and so on, who belongs and who doesn't, um, and the politics of identity documents. But looking strictly at what has happened to Eldred as a town, which is what has happened to many of our towns, including the capital city, you've moved from a planned town to a place where a lot of creativity is allowed. We have in Kenya what I like to refer to as strip towns. These ones are just emerge along a road. 
you know, one long distance driver stops one day and spends the night, the next day somebody has a shark, the next, five years later there's a secondary school. Um, so, <laughs> seriously. So that kind of thing, um, I want to argue that spatial disarray has accompanied urbanization at the same pace as social services and designated public spaces have decayed, with no new recreational spaces being set aside, with parks disappearing and a walled off security, the imagination of a whole town is re-engineered. Its whole architecture is at variance with the Western cause of urbanism as organized social space. Indeed, those old colonial towns where midwives and nurses used to roam residential areas, talking uh, to new parents uh, about hygiene, trying to get them to understand child nutrition in a new context of urbanity, teaching them about first aid and so on. In other words, showing new arrivals how to occupy towns. Those kind of towns do not exist anymore. You know, there were people who used to keep records of ailments very dil diligently, the pressures on utilities, and these were social services. Those things have been stretched into, shall I call it non-existence or bare existence. Uh, it's interesting how the whole idea of independence, the cause of freedom, uh, very soon became a literal call for everyone to do as they please. Now, in this collapse of urban design and its accompanying socialization into urban life, Street-connected children and youth and their struggling guardians are not the problem, in my view. They are victims. But as victims, they do in turn change the character of the street and the transactions within it as they struggle to find escape mechanisms to flee their constraints, to create their own bonds and boundaries. But I want to talk about one of the big um, escape mechanisms, which is glue an industrial solvent that is used by shoemakers to secure rubber soles. For street-connected children and youth, glue is functional to the extent that it dulls the brain against hunger, fear, and cold, amongst many other difficult conditions. As the boy themselves say, one of the boys told me that glue gives him courage. When he's high on glue, he's able to ignore his dirty body, the lice that is crawling on him, and he can approach a stranger, ask for something, beg for money, beg for food. But in addition to its mind-altering capacities, glue occupies what Joseph Cottrell Boyce calls a social context of maintaining group solidarity. And he says, substance use within this population has been identified as both a coping mechanism as well as a component of a shared street culture that exists amongst uh, street social groups. It appears that function, addiction, and bonding blur into one. Um, and you know, sometimes you'll find young people, young kids or youth who are permanently high. And in such instances, glue sniffing becomes a way to avoid normal consciousness. They stay under the influence of solvents for as long as they possibly can. Now this same sort of cross-dimensional work of glue, as I call it, is seen in the funerary practices of Mashefa. There's a book I've been writing very slowly about death and funerary practice in, in modern Kenya. And so when I started working um, on these projects with street-connected children and youth in Eldoret, I was naturally interested in their funerary practices. How do they echo those of mainstream society, quote, unquote, what ethnic traditions do they borrow from, and so on and so forth. One day I shall finish writing, about, uh, writing that book. But for now, let me tell you about the funerary practice of Mashefa. Regardless of the circumstances of one's death, Mashefa unite to ensure a fitting burial. Typically, the base leader will manage fundraising to buy a coffin and to hire a hearse. Most often, it will be just a simple pickup truck. And always, they are very proud of being buried in the cemetery in Eldred Town. There's no talk of taking them to some rural outpost, even where they know their parents. There's pride in being buried in the cemetery in town. Now, on the morning of the funeral, members of the different bases in town will gather early at the local cemetery as their leaders go out to collect the body from the mortuary. Once they are united at the cemetery, Mashefa will sing hymns and popular gospel anthems. Prayers are conducted by one of their own because some of the street-connected children and youth even go by the nickname Pastor. Years of consciously or unconsciously listening to street preachers, of hanging around Christian revival meetings known as Keshas, and occasional visits to church, uh, years of hanging around um, those kind of places have turned this, some of these young people into very fluent preachers with a wide array of memorized Bible verses. 
It is not unusual for glue and some money to be included in the rituals of the day. As the singing is going on, somebody will approach the coffin holding a few coins, a bottle of glue, and place it inside the casket beside the deceased or even in his hand or her hand along with a few coins and bid him or her to earn to arm, rather, to arm himself or herself properly for the next world. They're very emotive ceremonies, as you can imagine. Mashefa bonds are carried to the grave. Tears will flow abundantly for as difficult as their lives might very often be, Mashefa see the finality of death as a bleak loss. They do not see it as a solution to the lives that they lead. Now let me try and conclude, bring all those things together, by asking the question, is street life anti-African society. I've shown that while Mashefa represent a subculture, they also interact with mainstream cultural practices and borrow from them very consciously, thus demonstrating a need to belong and to be included in the general scope of what is regarded as acceptable. Their strong desire to go through conventional African life experiences like marriage and childbearing, I think is something we should uh, pay attention to. Their gendered attitudes to sex, their engagement in gambling. Did you know that Kenya is a nation of gamblers? Uh, and you find that same practice of gambling amongst street communities. Their resort to Christian practices of praise and worship, for me, are all very apt examples of their absolute Kenyanness. They couldn't be more Kenyan if they tried. However, where cultural divergences exist, let me agree with Matthew Davis that we might call what we might call antisocial or anti-society can be seen as counter-hegemonic uh, in that it formulates an alternative view of the world in response to an elite's uh, implicit domination of discourse. The politics of recognition ignores human rights, including those of street-connected children and youth. But clearly, there is no uniformity in the experience or practice that we call Kenyan culture. Urban Kenya is a conglomeration of cultural practices in the same way that the idea of urban Kenya Kenyans is the sum total of many threads. Its varieties are shaped by various influences, local and global, that filter in arbitrarily across the landscape of urbanization. But more importantly, these varieties are a factor of class differentials. I think we can't escape that. And in actual fact, like I started off by saying, you know, why I decided to change the work I was doing a little bit was to answer that question, you know, if you do not belong to a certain class in a town, does it mean um, that you cannot access a fluid uh, identity? Um, and this was my concern. And I, and I, and I think that the, what I have seen is, yes, there are class differentials. Uh, yes, there are similarities. But there will also be fundamental differences. And, but one of my main arguments in this time is the death of public good has led to a reformation in urban culture and the contours of belonging in an urban area are mores that each social group evolves for itself, shaped by the economic, political, and spatial pressures that it comes under. Those who can afford to buy order will live in gated communities and they visit high-end malls. They experience space very differently. At every social level, high or low, group solidarity is maintained through the sharing of a common subculture of spatial understandings of games, of activities, of dress, of language, and bodily actions. I've tried to demonstrate that the criminality that street-connected children and youth are often accused of is, in fact, a mirror image of the criminal neglect of urban spaces and social services by local and national governments, which often succumb to a very narrow jingoistic agenda in their struggles to retain political power. As David Ayuku and Naomi Van Stapele show in their respective studies of street life in Eldoret and in Madare, Nairobi, street children networks should not be primarily viewed as a supporting, a supporting gang and organized criminal behavior, as is often implied in the public discourse. Rather, street children networks could be seen as a resource for developing a modern, democratic, and ethnically diverse society in Kenya. And I have to say at this point that the communities in Eldoret that I've dealt with, um, they're, they're not very happy about this word gang because it's always used in a negative sense. And as Naomi Van Stapelle's work showed, sometimes those gangs are actually working gangs. They're doing something honest, profitable, above um, the line of, of, of criminality. So when you use the word gang, you give them a label that doesn't necessarily answer to their activities. 
In as much as street connected children and youth will pronounce differences in character between them and others who live in a different base, they define themselves more by the things they share but than by the ones that separate them. Health and well-being studies have been critical in illuminating the realities of street-connected children and youth working across disciplinary boundaries. These health workers have begun to design alternative rites of passage for this community. So, and the point about these alternative rites of passage is that aside from stemming disease, you know, for example, voluntary male medical circumcision, apart from stemming disease, the emerging rights that are being developed can give cultural recognition to a group that is always struggling to find legal right, municipal acceptance, and national belonging. As critical as a national identification document is, when the state doesn't recognize you, you can fill your void by becoming a man or a woman in cultural terms that are known and accepted by the majority. It's the last paragraph, bear with me. <laughs> Till you could have made this wine. Um, Finally, and because glue is often held out as the clearest example of the deviance and criminality of street-connected children and youth, I observe that glue is actually a metaphor for very many things, good and bad. Solvents are usually thinners, things which dilute others. But on the streets, glue does more than that. It becomes a binding agent. It binds one in addiction, and it binds one to a group, legitimizing one's belonging in Jamia Mashefa. The fact that glue provides a physical, emotional, and spiritual escape does not dilute the Mashefa claim to Kenyanness, in my view. Indeed, it seems to me that one way of being Kenyan, of engaging in the disappointments, dislocation, and dystopias that define Kenyan life, and which I talk about more fully in my book, Kenya at 50, is precisely by finding an alternative bond, an escape. Some Kenyans are literally held together by glue or other intoxicants. Others are held together by religion. And yet others will use regular benchmarking trips abroad, like this one, to find reason to remain hopeful. <laughs> Arguably, many Kenyans are held together by a combination of two, maybe even all three, so an intoxicant there, uh, excessive religion here, a trip abroad there. Um, the, the point is that we all escape. I mean, I mean, seriously, in other words, at the end of the day, the modes of belonging in Kenya echo one another in my view. So logically, none has a right to determine who belongs and who doesn't, whose culture is valid and which one is inferior. Because as new identities evolve, they echo the practices of older and already existing ones in significant and binding ways. Thank you. Thank you.